Joining me now, a returning guest on the next film school podcast. I thought once was going to be all I was ever going to get. I'm like, man, he's not going to want to come back on the show. But here we are now. We, we're uh, can I say to the folks at home, we're kind of text buddies. We talk about, uh, you know, Mavs games, Knicks games, um, his love for Julius Randle, my love for Luka Doncic. So we figured let's bring it back to the pod. And our um, mutual hate for one player, too. <laughs> and we're going to get to that, too. Um, as you know from listening to the last time he was on, former um, New York Met, along with uh, several other teams. He's a radio host on 105.3 The Fan um, in Dallas. Mike Bassick, welcome back, my man. How are you? Thanks, man. We share too many things in common now. Both our teams eliminated in the first round and um, our love and hate for certain players. And I've, I've jumped on the Knicks bandwagon. I'm not jumping off, but we need some help in New York. I'm more concerned about my maps, but we need we need like a top – 15 player to really take us over the top in New York. So I love how you say us, by the way, I, we, listen, <laughs> we'll, we'll take, I think the bandwagon, it's like, I don't, it's like a giant barge. There's more than enough room for anybody who wants to come. It's fine. Um, I, I'll start here. We, I think we spoke about it. Maybe it was a couple months before the playoffs. Um, we, the Knicks were not assured of even making the playoffs, let alone get a top four seed. And then what happened, happened. You guys were in a in pretty good spot, but like un- unsure. Now we're sitting here. What's happened, happened. Some good, some not so good. Which team do you think is more, let's say, I don't want to say disappointed. That's not the word. Like perturbed with how things have ended this season. Wow. I think the Knicks kind of came out of nowhere for just being an NBA fan this year Mm. where you're like, wow. And there was the expectation after what Luca did in the bubble and taking the Clippers to six that you need to be a, a better seed and winning in the first round is now the next step. And that didn't happen for the Mavericks. And then after the article on the athletic came out and Donnie Nelson gets let go slash fired slash quits, Then Rick Carlisle quits. I would say right now we're more perturbed and more in a state of like, what the hell is Mark Cuban doing where that's been y'all's situation for at least a decade. I was about to. Now we're put into the situation of what the hell is Mark Cuban doing? So we here have had dysfunction on top of dysfunction. But it always goes back to the man in the I don't know if he has the highest office. I'm sure he has the nicest office. Um, And it's like, well, of course. And it all ties together. You guys have been obviously some issues here and there with with some behind the scenes stuff. But for the most part, always viewed as a well functioning as far as the basketball side of it goes. Right. Mm -hmm. The basketball side of it. Tip top shape. Right. Now, this has all happened. But Cuban is still there. I always looked at Cuban as like, okay, he might say an odd thing every now and then, but he's a, you know, he's an owner that has a, a, a good sense of what's going on in his organization. Again, basketball wise, is that not true anymore? Or where are we at here? Well, I think what we're realizing, and there's been hints of this for years, because Jerry Jones, we know he's he's screwed up one of the greatest organizations in the history of sports now for two and a half decades. And we know the reason why is because he has the ego of, I have to get all of the credit. I've already won enough. I'm in the hall of fame. The only thing that really I care about now is getting credit and not Jimmy Johnson pretty much for building a championship team. Well, it seems like Mark Cuban over time has become, Hey, I know everything, you know? And and so he is now, in charge of like, I'm so popular, my, and he has a huge ego that I can do this now on my own. I'm going to become Jerry Jones. And it seems like over the last three years since they got Luca, like he started to more and more from what we found out, he started more and more going, I can do this on my own. I'll hire, we call him Vegas Bob here in Dallas. Bob I say, when you said ego, I'm like, well, he must like to hang out with people who are like him because from everything you're hearing about Bob's ego, it's as big as there is. Yeah. So we're just worried now if we start looking at a bigger picture, because we're so excited from Dirk and yes, Dirk career is fading and he doesn't get any help as he, you know, drops out of being an all-star player. 
And, you know, the whole time, like, we're going to get Dwight Howard, we're going to get Carmelo, or we're going to get Chris Paul, or we're going to get Darren Williams. And they would have all been horrible moves, honestly. And they none of them worked out. And then DeAndre Jordan gets locked in a room after the Mavs thought they had him signed. And thank God that fell through, too. So, like, every move they wanted to do ended up being, thank God it didn't happen. But then their secondary moves ended up being bad moves, whether it was Chandler Parsons or giving Wesley Matthews a zillion bucks or Harrison Barnes or, you know, like, it nothing – Worked out. So now we're looking at this bigger picture of after the 2011 championship, there's a decade of almost everything that they wanted to do would have been really bad. And everything that they did was really bad, except for Luca. Like Luca is a plus can't believe it because right now, as we sit here, we had this because people are trying to put this like, Oh, Trey young. Cause it was the trade of Trey young and Luca. And we're like, guys, the 10% of people that do this to us on the radio, we're like, mm-hmm. guys, if Luca was on the Hawks right now with all those pieces around him, they might be the favorites out of the four teams left to win it all in Las Vegas. And if we put Trey young on Dallas and took Luca off, the New York Knicks probably have the 10th pick in the draft this year off of not making the playoffs. I mean, and I like Trey Young, good player. Very, but, he, I mean, he's really shown a lot. Let's be very clear about that. But yeah. there's, but there's Trey a Young, major difference, and there's Luca. Yeah, there's a major difference. So we're we're scared right now that Mark might start Jerry Jonesing this franchise. Well, that's let me tell you the thing about having an owner that you have to ask questions about is it sucks. It's there's because no matter what good is happening, you're always like, Oh, is it, is it going to last? Right. Can he, and we had this with the 2012, 13 team with the Knicks, they had that great run. And then there were some things that happened behind the scenes. And then that was short lived. So now you're in this situation where Donnie gone, Rick Carlisle, Gone. I well, actually, let me spend a second on Rick because we, we've talked about Rick before. I told you, I thought he was a great coach. I know no playoff series wins since the championship. Um, do you do you think they're going to miss him? I guess maybe that's the best way to ask it. I'm being an optimistic fan this week because if I look at what happened to the Hawks, and I'm not saying they had a Rick Carlisle that they fired when they were 14 and 20. You look at Doc Rivers, and it's pretty much the same team in L.A., and now they get Tyrone Lue, and they're in the conference finals. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then you look at, uh, you know, Milwaukee's had their same coach for a while, but it's like if they don't win at all, there's still a chance that maybe Rick Carlisle becomes their coach after Milwaukee's season is over unless they kind of win the championship. At least that's the rumors here that maybe Rick is, is Milwaukee's next coach if they ultimately don't. When it also, I look at these teams that are in the conference finals, three of the four teams kind of have new coaches, uh, Monty Williams, too, in, yeah, in sure. Phoenix with For all the two years. Yeah. And so I'm optimistic that maybe, as I think Rick Carlisle's a great coach, but maybe a change of voice yeah. could maybe take a team to the next level that the team couldn't get to. But that's being very optimistic because I do believe Rick Carlisle is one of the best in-game coaches in the NBA. And then we find out through the athletic article, he never wanted to start Boban and run zone defense. That was Bob Volgaris. And because Bob has so much say with Mark Cuban and he knew if he didn't do it, he was gone anyways. He did exactly what the analytic Vegas Bob told him to do. And so they won game five, but he just sticks with it. And we're watching it going – I know our, I know we have a weak bench. I know that like Dwight Powell's not that good of a player, but at times he brings energy. We can't at least play man defense. Like this zone crap ain't working anymore. Like it was yeah. a great change up, but you can't play zone in the NBA a lot of minutes and it work. And but they wouldn't go away from it because of Vegas Bob. It's it's a change up, like you said. It's not uh you can't have a steady diet because then eventually yeah. you're you know it's it's not gonna end well. So the series ended poorly, just like for the Knicks, our series ended poorly. Um, let's turn to actually, let's turn to the Knicks for a second, because you, so before we, we started recording, you were about, you were telling me about a, a, a segment you guys are going to do on the radio. You have your, you're, you're ranking your top 10 NBA players and you profusely apologized to me that Randall did not make your top 20. Meanwhile, I did a top 40 list on this show a week and a half ago. And I think I had Randall at like in the twenties, it was okay. around 25. Um, and I didn't think I was being unfair. Like, 
I am curious what your thoughts are just watching from afar. And obviously you're a professional athlete. When you see something like that, and we're not talking about a kind of a bad performance. I mean, he shot 30% from the field. That's it's not yeah. what you want. Right. Um, is that going to be tough for him? Do you think to kind of get over? And if you were a Nick fan, which you kind of are now, um, how concerned, where's your level of concern going forward? Concerned. Um, but I do think he's a very good player. And I think you mentioned this months ago as Randall was doing great. And I would watch some of your post game stuff after certain games and how excited you were getting and everything. And it was awesome. And seeing just everybody texting in that are the Knicks yeah. fans and how excited they were is, but you put it right at the time. It's like, this is awesome. And he's going to make an all NBA team, but it doesn't mean now all of a sudden he's a top 10 player in yeah. the league or somebody, maybe you build your whole system around. He's a hard worker. He's a grinder. I think he's mm-hmm. overcome a lot because Byron Scott trashed him in kind of his first season because he plays one game, blows out his knee. Then Byron Scott trashes him as a kind of soft player who doesn't want to put in the work to actually be good. And he's overcome that. He's had now three good seasons in a row, that last one in New Orleans. And I know maybe not the percentages were great in New York, but he's been a good player for New York and elevated this year. So I like him a lot, but he probably can't be the leader of a contending team, of a team that makes the playoffs, he proved he can. Yeah. But can you give him the ball the way that – I know Luca hasn't won a playoff series, but I think if anybody has a basketball education, you can see like Luca's doing Jordan, LeBron, Magic Johnson-like stuff. He just needs some help around him say, there. Give him a team. Give him, yeah. a, give him a team. And we'll get to the, the guy that is was supposed to help him with that. But, no, I mean, if you – if I. What do you think? Here's a question for you. Put Luca on these Knicks in place. And I, again, I'm not saying that I'm not trying to throw any shade at Randall. No. Randall had a wonderful season, but put him in place of Randall. Do I think they probably beat the Hawks, right? I think so. In fact, I, I will say this, and I'm not trying to take a shot at the Knicks here because we talked about this because of Trey Young getting the love. And I get that he's, he should get love right now, but like to compare him to Luca to me is crazy. Yeah, no, I know. I agree. I think if the Mavericks would have played the Hawks in a seven-game series, we think the Mavericks would have beat them in six or seven games. Close series, tough series, but we think the Mavs could have could have beat them in six or seven. Um, that being said, if Luka has that team around him, and I know this isn't fair because you got to kind of take off Julius Randle, but if you kept Julius Randle – and you well, just added Luca. That's a championship contending might win it all in 2022 team. Why? And you're, you're, you must be reading my mentions because as soon as that athletic article dropped, I had, and listen, I don't blame anybody for wanting this coming out of the woodwork and be like, okay, so what are we going to give up to get Luca? And I'm trying to be very nice to people. I'm like, look, there is no, like I, here's, Okay, this is how much respect I have for the kid. I think I wrote maybe two, three months ago um, in terms of trade value. Like my current trade value in the league, I had Luca number one. But I said in the since young Shaq, I think he has a higher trade value than anyone except young LeBron. Maybe some other versions of LeBron too, but his contract situation was iffy. And um, I thought maybe Steph in like 2000, like when Steph first went supernova. Yeah. Other than those two scenarios, I don't know that anyone in the last 15, 16 years has been more valuable as a player slash asset than Luka Doncic is right now. And that's why that article was so unnerving to me. I mean, if I was a Mavs fan, I'd be. It's scary. So what's the what's the tenor of, of, you know, how how you guys are feeling about this? I'm worried now. I know Luka pretty much told Tim McMahon that he's going to sign the Supermax without saying he's going to sign it, but because he's done things that you just don't do in the first three years of an NBA career, he already reached the ability to do Supermax instead of just Max. Yeah. So he's going to be making a five-year contract, 200 million, but we'll probably get an opt out either in year five or year four to make sure that he controls more of the situation. And we're worried here because I'll put it this way. This is how bad I think my Dallas Maverick team is. And I got a lot of crap for this all year because I went over the top at times and I shouldn't use this word, but I'll use it here. And it's not fair. It's not, but I said, Luca has a trash team. 
Oof. And that's what harsh. I meant, and what, and that's too harsh. They have, he has a lot of below average role players on his team for the most part. And I said this, Houston had the worst record in the NBA, and I know they tanked to get there for the most yeah. part. But right now, if I put, if I traded all the Dallas Mavericks, every single one of them, and kept Luka for all the Houston Rockets, I would have a better team. I'd have Christian Wood. I'd have John Wall. I'd have Kevin Porter Jr. I'd have Gordon, who can shoot the basketball. That's a good starting five, Tate. better than my starting five right now. And, and I don't need their second pick overall. I've already improved my team by trading every Dallas Maverick to the Houston Rockets besides Luka for yeah. all the Houston Rockets. I'd do the same thing. Oklahoma City's not a good team. Rebuilding. I would trade every Dallas Maverick. You get Shea, you get yeah. Dort, you get yeah. uh, you Poku, obviously. Big, At big, the big. time, they had Horford, and I thought oh, Horford okay. like, yeah. would, would help. Right now, you get Kemba, and Kemba's not going to be on Oklahoma City by the time the season starts. But, like, I just – that's how bad I think the team is around Luka. Uh, Hardaway Jr. has a place in the NBA. He's, I think, a great guy off the bench scoring because he's a gunner. He's going to shoot the ball, and at times he's going to shoot you to a win. At times you're going to be like, stop shooting the damn basketball. You can't make a shot. No, nobody knows that better than us. I, yes. we, we, we get it. And you're about to pay him um, some money. Uh, yeah. And so- Cuban, when Cuban loves his guys, and this was with Donnie, they pay, they make sure that that person is happy. And it's like, well, you could just give the dude 17 and that wins. Why do we have to go to 20? And I think, my opinion is, I think they're going to give uh, Hardaway Jr. four years, $80 million <sighs> because he's a good guy, because Mark Cuban loves him. Yeah. He's a good teammate, good community guy, like, all he checks all the boxes in the intangibles except for pathetic on defense and a streaky shooter. If he he is if he is your fourth best player, you're probably a really you're probably winning it all, right? I'm with you're, you. You're probably winning it all, and that's well, it's third best. The way the NBA is nowadays, it's like third best player money. And if you had a killer second best player, a really killer second best player, that would be fine. And now we could finally get to it. Mm. Ooh. The ghost. That's what I, because Dirk, Dirk, one of Dirk Nowitzki's nicknames was the ghost face driller. And <laughs> yeah, that's a cool nickname, right? That's a great nickname. I and never, knew, I never so, heard that one. And so when KP would actually score a basket uh, in the playoffs, I was like, that's the ghost. Cause I haven't seen him all game long. But I don't know if I said this to you on, on the last pod we did. I forget who I apologized to the person who tweeted this. Um, it was a, definitely a Mavs fan or a Mavs content creator or something who wrote about like KP. He's the best, like he's the best great shooter of all, uh, like you'll ever see who doesn't actually make shots. You know, he just, look- <laughs> I mean, he makes some shots. He doesn't make enough of them though. And like, I, it, it sounds bad. Um, it, Everybody, I feel like around the NBA, I don't know if it's the same is true there, feels like it's a matter of time. It do is it are you guys like counting the days? Or are you are you figure feeling like it's just a matter of who we can get for him? Do you just want him gone? Where, where are you at? I want to dump him for whatever you can get. I don't even care what you can get, just dump him. Because one of the best things that happened to the New York Knicks is they decided we're not going to build around him. He's, he's too much of a diva. He's too much of a me guy. He's honestly not that great. And at the time, he just made the all-star team. And I get it. Yeah. Then he's sitting out forever because of the knee injury. When most people come back after 9 to 12 months, he's like, I'm never coming back type of deal. He wouldn't even come back for the Mavericks. I know the Mavericks might have not pushed it. They're like, hey, whatever you want, KP and your brother. Like, I hate his brother. Too. Giannis. Giannis, baby. Uh, shout out to Giannis. Oh, and, boy. And so it's just really tough here. What we feel like is this, is that because Cuban is so stubborn and his ego is so huge, he's going to stick with, he's going to be great. We're going to make him great. He just hasn't been healthy type of deal, which he's never going to be healthy. He probably only has, I'm going to be my, I'm going to, he only probably has six years left in the NBA and they're going to be unhealthy years and his career is going to be done because of his legs. He's wearing, you don't see this on the, the games, but I'm at two of the playoff games. He has to wear heat packs on his knees when he does go to the bench because his knees get so locked up. 
Oh. That he can't just sit on the bench and watch a basketball game at 25 years old for 10 to 15 minutes because if he doesn't have heat on it, he can't get loose to actually go back into the game. That's a horrible sign from a 25-year-old. So he has 30 to 35-year-old knees already. Well, it's a horrible sign for a 25-year-old. It's a really horrible sign for a 25-year-old owed um, 100 and I forget the exact. It's over, I think it's, it's 101 for the next three seasons. That's it. And like, you know, this is the NBA. Everybody could get traded, right? We've seen we could yes. go through some of the contracts that could get traded. Someone will talk themselves into him. They yeah. will look at the package and they will say, we will figure it out one Please way God. or another. <laughs> Please God, somebody say that he can play. I'm just, I'm so fascinated because like there's this, I feel like the worst place you could be in the NBA is to have a best player who thinks, well, I could be the best player on a championship team and, and goes about it in that way, except for the fact that it it's just not there. And that's KP. I, he, he, I mean, is it, isn't it so obvious that that's what he thinks he is? Yes. And he doesn't engage with the team at all. Luca hates him by the way, like we kind of, Luca doesn't come out and say it, but think about how hard Luca plays and the energy in the, I get it. Like there's Luca's not perfect. Luca complains too much. Luca needs to figure out how to shoot free throw. Like he's fiery. You know, he's a fiery guy. He's you not know. perfect, but he's tough. Yeah. KP's the total opposite of tough. He's, he's just a wuss. And do you, look, there's Luca can't stand him. Luca, when I was there for game three, Mavs are up 2-0 in the series. You know, they get up 30 to 11. Luca's hitting every shot that he's taking. And as the game starts getting closer, and then you're looking to like, I need some help. You could see Luca look at KP in disgust at the lack of physicality, the lack of engagement just not wanting to get re- – like, you know, oh, it's a rebound. Well, there's people around me. I can't get touched by people because if he gets touched, then he just goes flying away. And so that's why he reminds me a lot of Sean Bradley because Sean Bradley was here in Dallas forever. Like, he's Sean Bradley. Like, you can just move him wherever you want. And once you move him, he's like, please stop it. I'll just move myself. Stop touching me. You know, so it's just – you could see the disgust – in yeah. Luca's face that that's my guy that I'm supposed to win yeah. with. And then Rick Carlisle, six minutes into the third quarter, because he's getting destroyed three plays in a row and he can't give you anything offensively because he's so soft. He just looks at Willie Cauley Stein, who's not a good basketball player. He's at a this 12th, point. He's, he's not yeah. right. He's a 12th man on a team. Like he's going to be in the NBA for two or three more years. It's like when guys get hurt during the regular season, come on in and give us 10 to 15 minutes. That's who he is. And it, we're going to have to go to Willie Cauley Stein. And Rick looks at Willie because I'm near the bench. And he looks at Willie, like with disgust, he goes, and yeah, I could hear him. That's how close it was. Awesome seats. And he goes, Willie, go get, go get KP. Like, it was just like a Willie, go get KP. I've tried. I've given it six minutes in the third quarter. He's doing absolutely nothing. He's not engaging. We've tried. We've given him the ball a few times. They're eating him up on defense. Now they're attacking him. And so it's just like, you go get them and I'll see if this turns this thing around. So um, you have a player who is, I, mean, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'll say it. Um, he's he's going to dominate the league for the next 10 years. Um, and it's the clock doesn't usually start ticking after year three, right? You usually get a little bit more of a grace period, but I think this is Zach Lowe who said this on his podcast. Luke is too good for that. He's too good for you to wait. Um, I am going into this offseason with the Knicks feeling like there is some pressure because this is New York and you better than anyone, better than anyone, you, Mike Bassick, know the mm-hmm. rules are different in New York. I could sit here as a fan and be like, listen, slow and steady wins the race. Don't rush it. Leon Rose is going to be feeling the pressure to like, look, let's let's build off of this somehow. Maybe not necessarily more wins, but somehow. So there's pressure here. I'm not sure that there is is any more pressure on any situation in the NBA more than the Mavs? Uh, is that is that unfair to say? No, I would say it's right there. I would say right Close now to it's the a top. different topic with Zion, but in New Orleans. They well, that's, probably, it. that's yep. the other one that people are asking me about. What can we send to New Orleans for Zion? I'm like, guys, the, 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 they would have to what – would, what, what would Luca have to do 
for Cuban to be like, okay, sure, I'll trade you. Would he? I, would he have to like set fire to the arena? I don't even. Yeah, know there's. He won't trade him. The only thing Luca can do, and he's not going to do this. But if I was Bill Duffy, is his agent, and I know that he won't do this. But if you're Bill Duffy, he already has the Jordan contract where he's making over, I think it's 10 to 15 million a year now with the yeah. shoe contract. Plus he's making good money already in the NBA. He's going to sign. Luke is going to sign after this Supermax because he's 22 years old. He's yeah. going to sign two more Supermax contracts. And I know he was Steph. Won't... Right. Steph's about to sign another 201 right now. Yeah. I will. I don't think that Luca will do this because it's too big of a risk. But if he really wanted to put pressure on the Mavericks, because he has two years left on his rookie contract, he could yeah. say, you know what? Money's never going to be an issue for me in this game. I'm going to make $300 million playing basketball, whether I sign this Supermax or not. I'm not signing the Supermax. I'm playing out year four and year five and see how it goes. Supermax is still going to be available from me from you. And if you aren't, if you haven't helped me, if I'm still having to play with the ghost, the stick figure, I'm leaving. And I don't think Luke is going to be that cutthroat and players can figure out how to leave while still on contracts. That's yeah. established already. Harden, AD, everybody, but he could really stick it to Cuban. He wouldn't trade him because of this, but he could say, Hey, I'm not signing the Supermax. I'm going to make 300 million in my career. I already got the Jordan deal too. So I'm playing out these two years and seeing if you guys can do anything. And that's what I think the Knicks fans, if you don't do anything this off season or, you know, that you have to hope because Zion seems to be pretty crapped out. I, I think that. that's the more, I know he's a year behind or a year right. younger or under, under service time than Luca. I think that's the more realistic one. And to and, you, and Zion's not going to hit the super max. Um, you don't think he's going to make all NBA next year? I think he's got a chance. It's a day. I, ch- I, I, I see you looking at your list. I, he's got, I think he's got a chance. He, he a chance. does have a chance, but he has to do that th- next year and the year after. Correct. To, Cause no, if I, he think he only, I think I uh, should check this. I think he only has to do it once. I think if you're all NBA one year in your, within two years of, of the, yeah, the end of the rookie contract. Okay, okay. For it. some reason, I thought you had to make it two years on your rookie I, deal. But I'm maybe I'm sure wrong. it's only one. But I know Luke has done it twice. Well, no, well, I mean, look, obviously. I, <laughs> so what I think could happen, and again, I think it's going to happen more with Zion, um, is he might walk in, you know, next summer and threaten what you just said. I'll take the qualifying offer. Yeah without ever actually intending on doing it. And it'll be up to the Pelicans to call his bluff with, with, um, with Luca. I think he's going to sign. Like we both think he's going to sign the Supermax. Yeah. Yeah, but if will. you get, if you get that option at the end, we've seen players force their way out with two years left. So now you're doing the math. Okay. So there's an option. So that means you're three years out. What's to say someone's not going to push it to two and a half seasons or three seasons left until they like, is anyone possibly going to have more power than Luka Doncic to, to go and And I, I just, I don't know. And I, I look, it, it, I, I'm not rooting for this to happen. I just, um, it's, it seems like there's a lot of pressure. That's all from, from I'll say opinion. this. And this is, I am a Maverick fan first, but I will say this. If Cuban and Vegas, Bob and Michael Finley, cause I think Michael Finley is going to be the, general manager, you know, kind of the figure of general manager. It's really going to be Mark and Vegas Bob. If they can't figure it out over the next two to three years on how to build something that looks like a championship contender, I'll just root for the team that Luca goes to. Wow. I'll just be like, look, I, I get it. Like we're never going to be good because I've seen, I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan kind of, I'm sick of Jerry Jones, but it's like, God bless I know you. that ultimately the Cowboys are never going to be great again. They're in that Washington situation, you know, yeah. with Snyder. And it's like, Hey, you can jump up and make the playoffs every once in a while. But like if Mark ruins this Cuban, which I think there's a good chance he does, this gives Knicks fans hope. I do think he ruins this. And in three years, Luca is going to to be out of Dallas. I hope I'm wrong being a Mavs fan, but if he does, I'm just going to follow Luca to wherever he goes. I do hate the Lakers the most. So if he does go to the Lakers, <laughs> that will be the worst for me. So I don't think purple and gold are his colors. I just something uh, about mo- that. 
most people think because Slovenia and where he's from that his number one choice, if he got to choose any team, if he was a free agent, that he would look to Miami. From what we get here from the people that know Luca, his favorite city, his kind of favorite everything is Miami. Interesting. So if if there was just like is he hit free agency and he could choose any city to play in, we from what we understand, Miami is kind of his favorite destination. And he and he doesn't have to worry about following in LeBron's footsteps because he's good enough in his own right to like no one's gonna look at it that way. Um I have one more random one for you before we get out of here. Josh- Wait, let's talk more about KP and how pathetic he is. <laughs> I can talk about KP how pathetic. I just I'm really fascinated to see what team he goes to. I, cause again, he, ru- he ruined us because Luca got so good so quick. This is kind of a major point I've been making on my radio station. Okay. Luca is so good so fast. That's not supposed to happen. Like Durant wasn't this good. So Durant gets Westbrook and gets Harden. But what happens is, is Luca is getting really good his rookie year. And then the Mavericks, give every asset they have available, expiring contracts. At the time, Dennis Smith Jr. was a quality-looking young prospect. So he the was, ninth overall. He was overall interesting. Pick. And then two first-round picks. So we get – the Mavericks gave up every asset they could possibly give to get Porzingis. So now it's based off of Luka has to become great. He did. KP, because we sold all our future assets – he has to be great too. And he isn't even a top, I don't even know if he's a top 100 player. He's probably right on the borderline of a top I, 100 player. I, I see, but that's what's the tough conversation about Porzingis because if you, let's, for argument's sake, I'm, I can't believe I'm actually going to say nice, something nice about Porzingis. To what I was saying before about if you put him and he's, you run your offense through him and you design your offense around him, your team's going to suck. Yeah, Bar- barring a, I, I mean, I guess there's some roster things you could do, but like, no, your team's not going to be very good. He'll look probably okay for whenever he's on the court, and he'll it's, be happy. You oh, know, the, me- the media here. This is maybe you guys already know this in New York. When the Mavericks lose and he has a good game, he's happy and willing to talk to the media and excited. When the Mavericks win. And let's just say he had 11 and 11 points and five rebounds and didn't have a good game. He acts like the Mavericks lost and is moping around after the game and, and doesn't really want to talk to the media. And when he does, it's like, well, we just have to figure out how to use me better. And this is, I guess this is my role on the team. And it's like, we just won. We just beat the Clippers like in the regular season or something. And he, he is all about himself that he can't even see a big picture. And I think that's the another reason, reason Luca hates him is because it's like, dude, this is about winning and winning a championship. I won as a kid and won MVP mm-hmm. in, at Real Madrid, and you can't see that we just won the game or we just lost the game, and all KP can see is I want mine. You know, it's funny. Oh, God, this is, has to be – might be two years ago now – um, Ian Bagley, who uh, now with SNY, he used to be with ESPN, was on when our podcast was Zach Lowe. It was after the KP, the, the KP trade um, and spoke about I, I think it was Ian that said it, that he had heard it did not. He, I want to be very clear. Ian did not like report this 100 percent, but he had he had heard one of the things he had heard is that uh, Porzingis was not too thrilled with the idea of the Knicks going after um, Durant and making Durant their big play because then obviously it wouldn't be KP's team anymore. It would be Makes Kevin Durant's sense. team. Makes sense. And it certainly seems to check out with what you're saying. Yeah, he, 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 he hates that Luca gets all the credit here. He feels like he's on the same level and can't understand why he doesn't get the ball on the same level and why he doesn't get the praise on the same level. I mean, he is so immature and so soft and so weak and I can't say enough horrible things about him, yet he's probably going to be on my Mavericks next year. And because I'm a baseball guy, here's my plan to get Porzingis better. Remember when I played from 1996 to 2008? Yes. It's only a 25-game suspension. You pump KP full of steroids and human growth hormone every day from now until he gets tested. He tests positive. Who cares? He's going to miss 25 games anyways. He gets hurt all the time. 
But Emmanuel Class A, I know this is baseball, but Emmanuel Class A, who pitches for the Indians now, used to pitch for the Rangers, he got caught with steroids. His body has totally changed from a kid to a man. And I'm like, the only chance we have is to pump that little skinny guy full of steroids and HGH and have him in the gym all day so he doesn't get pushed around everywhere. I know it's not going to happen. I know it's kind of a joke, but I wouldn't be opposed to pumping him full of steroids and HGH. And I'm honest here. I know you can get hurt doing that, but a lot of people I played with got a lot better on steroids and HGH. As I as I drink from my New York Mets, uh, what is this? 2015 uh, National League Champions Cup. Um, I, I, I <laughs> man, you could probably tell some stories. Um, I, okay, wait, wait, hold on. We're, I can't let you go without. We we have to come up with at least one fake trade here. I'm literally looking right now at the NBA standings. And like, but the foot, it's like even these terrible teams, like the Magic or like the, P- the Pistons, they don't, like they just got the number one pick of the draft. They're not going to touch Chris. You think the, you know, the Rockets, they're bringing in Evan Mobley. Like they don't want him. The, I mean, the one that's been bandied about, even I think, I feel like even before the Kemba trade, but maybe now after it is the Thunder. Like, I, do you, do you have any interest in Kemba Walker? I, I, I Yes, but as much as I've crushed KP, Kemba, I don't know how much he helps. And if you get Kemba Walker, and I'm not a – like Jalen Brunson is a great backup point guard. Great backup point guard. Now, for some reason, I don't know if it was Vegas Bob – but Rick kind of went away from him as that playoff series went on. So that was played 10 minutes, I think, in the last game, right? Yeah. So – but if you got Kemba – where where in the world does little Jalen Brunson play? Because oh, you know, I, can, I can answer that. Well, and to your point, if he wanted to go to the Knicks, like at that point, I think if you traded for Kemba, you need to trade Jalen and get something that makes more sense for your team. Because having Kemba and Jalen on the team with Luca being a primary ball handler, it doesn't make sense. You can't play Kemba and Jalen together; they're too no. little. And so, so at that point, if you brought in Kemba, you have to make two or three other moves to kind of maybe make that work. But I'll throw this one out, and it's probably too much. But Kevin Love is well, not very good anymore. Porzingis yeah. is better, much younger. I think they both I, – I think Love has like two years left in the league, and probably Porzingis has five or six until his knees go on him. But they're not happy with Colin Sexton, and he's a ball hog. Yeah. But like, would they looking at their pick, they have the third pick and it sounds like they might go a little bit bigger than smaller in that, you know, just reading mock drafts right now, but would they go, Oh, we'll take Porzingis and we'll give you Kevin love to get him off of our books. You'd be taking a similar contract one year longer, but to do that, if you guys aren't willing to max out Colin Sexton, cause he's at the year where you can do it to him. Yeah. Would they say we're going to move in another direction and we're going to go with KP, Darius Garland, you know, Allen, um, who they draft last year, Oroku or whatever his name is. Uh, Okoro, yeah. I yeah. like Okoro. I like Okoro. Yeah. yeah, so like I'm, I'm throwing that out. It's probably a 1% chance of happening, but I'm just throwing out maybe there's options where you look at stuff like that. I, I find – I see I love this stuff because in terms of trades – there are two teams I think make a lot of sense for, for the Knicks to trade with. One is the Pelicans because there's you got the Lonzo noise. We have all this cap space. We're in need of a starting point guard. They have Eric Bledsoe. They can't wait to get rid of him. Um, they have the 10th pick. We have the 19th and the 21st. Is there something there? And the other team is Dallas because I have to think, and this is why, to just go back to the KP trade for one second, I think there's an argument I'm not going to say the Knicks lost the tra- the trade because uh, I don't want people coming after me with pitchforks and and, uh, and and torches and everything. But like, I still believe personally the Knicks could have gotten more for him if they didn't prioritize the salary dumping part uh, of it, which they which they did. That's the only uh, thing I've ever said. I'm but, with you on that. Yeah, and and what do we get? We got the 21st pick in the, in 2023. I mean, barring anything happening to Luca, which you know I hope nothing does because th- that would be terrible for basketball. Like that pick is going to be about the same or, or worse. Right. I think that pick is a lot more valuable to you guys because it allows you to do whatever you're going to do trade in in trade to try to package. You know, you could throw an extra swap in there. You have it's the pick. You get so. 
I, I don't know. I th- and we there's Jalen Brunson, I Leon Rose, the connection there. Um, you know, you have uh, also Josh. There's the other guy I wanted to ask you about. Josh Richardson has that player option. Eleven million dollars played. What did he play? Thirty minutes in the in the series? What, yeah, something? it just as the season progressed, he just went downhill, and that's part of the problem too. From what we understand here, Rick Carlisle asked him to do specific things. He did it to Rick's uh, what Rick wanted him to do, but then Vegas Bob Bulgaris says you shouldn't play him anymore. So then Josh Richardson's like, I did exactly what you said, and now I'm getting benched for it. Really? And it's like Rick was like, I don't control the lineup anymore. Oh Jesus! No wonder he couldn't wait to get out of that. So that, uh, so that's that's the that's why he resigned because he's like, if if I'm not going to actually be able to coach the team and put in the players I want to put in and win, what's the point of having me here? And he's like, I quit. Especially if you're Rick. I mean, you have a championship. You're Rick Carlisle. You're wider yeah. regarded as one of the top five coaches in the league. Him and Donnie are tight too. So that also obviously played. Once Donnie lost the battle to Bob Volgaris, then Rick's like, I'm not sticking around for one more year uh, of this. And then you're going to fire me anyways. Well, I don't know exactly what the trade would be, but could you imagine if the Knicks and Mavs engaged in another trade involving KP with obviously it would be a three team trade. Maybe okay. there's, you know, we're taking on salary. We're getting Brunson. We're giving you guys your pick back. Like, I don't know what it is. Okay. But there's, there's something, I, there's gotta be something there somewhere in the, in the, in the landscape. I just, uh, you know, we'll see. We got, we got a guy in our front office, Brock Aller, who is like the, the, the cap wizard. So if anybody could figure it out, it's him. So I, I, got, I have a few Knicks questions for you. Uh, please. Okay. Quickly had a much better season, I believe, from afar than Obi Toppin. Yes, that's accurate. Do you guys believe that Obi Toppin will keep developing or that wasn't a good pick? Is that somebody you want to try to just move to a rebuilding team to try to get more veteran help to a team that's already accomplished a major goal of like looking like an established playoff team? You wouldn't know it from the numbers, but he, I don't want to say he made a leap at the end of the year. That's a bit too, too aggressive, but he started to get it. Like, you know, when you're watching a guy and you're like, oh, he's starting to figure it out now. That was topping over the last 10 or so games of the regular okay. season. Um, I'll put, uh, here, here, I'll say this. There was one guy, uh, game five, the, the, the game that the Knicks got injured to get, or uh, eliminated against the Hawks whose uh, name was being chanted by the Garden Faithful, and it was Obi Toppin. Because he came in, starting to do some little things, made a nice basket. He was uh, He's starting to get it. I think all he needs is opportunity. I'm so excited to see him next year. Um, so I don't think they, they want to move him anywhere. Because the free agent market is very weak this year, and the Knicks have tons of cap space, I believe the most in the NBA. Maybe somebody has See, more. The, uh, the Spurs have a lot, and yeah. we'll know now the Thunder don't because they took on. I know the Heat have a max contract spot available. Actually, do they still? Because I feel like the BAM extension might have. Well, whatever. It's close. Okay. The Knicks have a lot of cap space. Would how how I know I uh, being in New York I know there's no patience it's very little patience to build something it's like okay we've taken this step now win a championship yeah. and I'm trying to you know have patience here in Dallas because it's like we got the championship number one guy but we have a whole bunch of building to do around him will Knicks fans be really mad or frustrated whatever the word is if the Knicks if Leon Rose goes you know what. A few of the things that I had cooking that could have taken us to the next level did not work out. I'm not just going to do something to do something and ruin the possibility of 2022 or 2023. Real Nick fans, who I, I like to think I cater to on this show, um, will stand up and applaud another. I don't want to say another summer of relative inactivity um, because there there is a sense that there is – a very clear the, the Knicks lack shot creation, right? That's, that's very clear. And, and that holds back kind of the rest of, of, of the team. And like, until you get that, you can't really be on uh, as competitive with the big boys. There is a sense that they need to do, they need to add a piece in some way, shape or form there. But Nick fans will stand up and applaud um, another summer where no bad money is, is, is given out. Um, you know, and, and I think they will be fine with that. I mean, hell, this might seem crazy to say, but like if they, um, 
not hit the reset button, but if they somehow, like, for instance, th- this isn't going to happen, but if they got into the top five of this draft, if like Cleveland was actually serious about trading that pick and it cost the Knicks Julius Randle. Now you might sit here and be like, well, that's insane. Julius Randle was eighth in the MVP. But like, if they could add another a true potential foundational piece, I think a lot of Nick fans would be like, wow, they really are thinking long term here. They're not going to do that, obviously, because yeah. I, I, a, I don't think that trade's available. And, and I just I don't think they quite have that kind of appetite for it. But, yeah, no, they're, I think they'll be patient. I'll be patient. And that was interesting because you just got me like, would you I'm going to now ask you another question that I didn't have since you just brought up number three. Now, this is far down the road, but. Would you be willing to trade Julius Randle for, let's say, number seven and 14 and something else from Golden State? Because Golden State's going to go for it, so they're willing yeah. to trade both those picks. I didn't know that you guys were thinking about possibly like trying to move up that far in the draft. So I, I don't think I don't think they are. I don't think most Nick fans are. I don't I don't think it's realistic um, in this particular draft. I don't think top yeah. four is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because I mean, I don't know how much, you know, like, all out of that, we think there's a superstar category. Basically, you know, if look, I don't have to tell you, you've been watching Luka Doncic. The most valuable asset you could have in the league is a guy who's a clear true blue superstar on his rookie contract. Um, And then you just got to keep him happy, which, you know, we'll see. But um, no, I think the only way that they would ever even pick up the phone on Randall is if they knew they were getting something back. That was, I mean, look, nothing's a sure thing in the draft. But, you know, I, I think, you know, some of those guys up top have a chance to be so. And I also I also one other thing, I, I don't think that they would ever send him to a place that he did not want to go. I think he, he would have to essentially not that he has like a no trade clause or right, anything, but right. like with the whole, you know, because I think reput- part of the reason why the reputation of the Knicks have started to turn around is because reputation, the, Leon Rose realizes his reputation matters and the Knicks reputation matters. And they're trying to, you know, be upstanding where that's concerned. Okay. Can RJ Barrett become the best player on the New York Knicks in 2022? So that would be, if you guys didn't do a major move to go get somebody that's better than Julius Randall, could RJ Barrett improve in year three where you're talking around the all-star break going, yeah. is RJ Barrett our best player now? Can he? Yes, he can. I think he can. I can't believe I'm sitting here saying that, but yes, I think he absolutely can. I think we look, what do you need to succeed and be great as a professional athlete? All the greats, the true greats that you saw, what do they have? I have to think is work ethic. One of the top qualities like undying yes. worth that like belief in yourself, confidence that you are great, you know, maybe bordering on arrogance. And then you show some stuff on the court or, or on the field in your case, like all the signs are there. He, and he knows what he needs to fix. That's the other thing. And he seems willing right. to fix them. You know, I talked to kids about this and it comes from playing major league baseball and look at times I became a hoper and that's why I got my ass kicked on the mound at times. And Julius Randle became a hoper in the playoffs. And what I mean by that, when you talk about the confidence and the work ethic is confidence is so easy to lose and so hard to gain Mm -hmm. is when you're on the mound, I'll just talk about my profession. When you're on the mound, you have to know When you step on that rubber, you have to know you're going to execute this pitch. Now, whatever happens after you execute that pitch, you believe like something good is going to happen because I'm going to execute this pitch and we're going to get an out here. I'm going to get out of this situation, whatever it is. When you're on the mound and you become a hoper, and I think this relates to a lot of things in life, when you say, I hope this works, I hope I can execute this. When you turn into a hoper and not a knower, that's when you fail. You, you're going to fail a hundred, almost 100% of the time when you become a hoper. And so I always say to kids that I'm teaching, when you get on that mound, I want you to know you can throw that pitch inside for a strike. I want you to know you can throw that change up, uh, you know, in a full count. I want you to know you can, because when you know you can do it, whether I know you can or whether your mom and dad know you can or your teammates know you can, doesn't matter you what I know, know or what they know. If you don't know it and yeah. you don't believe it, you turn into a hoper and hopers fail all the time. You know how we know that R.J. Barrett, to use your term, is not a hoper. He's a knower because when he was starting off the year, when he was 0 for 21 from three and then had another stretch where he was 1 for 21, to me, every time he fired away, he fired it look like expecting it to go in, you know? 
And that to me was always a great sign. And then sure enough, from that point until the end of the year, he was one of the most proficient three point shooters in the league. So um, yeah, I think he can. Do you think he can from afar? He's got to get better with this right hand. Yeah, he does. When I watch him, uh, and I think he can't look, he's a young guy, right? I mean, 20, he just turned 21. Yeah. Right. And so, and there's a lot of improvement that can happen, but from what I saw from afar, obviously not watching every Knicks game, but watching most of the playoffs and watching some of their nationally televised games, I'm like, I liked him out of college and I think he made big improvements. I think now you have to respect his three point shot, his rookie year. You could just be like, I don't care. Like shoot 10 of them at best. You're going to make three at very best. And I'm leaving you wide open yeah. and you can maybe only make three out of 10. Now, if you leave them open, you probably say he's going to make five out of 10 and he might get hot enough to hit seven out of 10. So we have to respect that, which makes getting to the basket easier for him. And then I think his next step that he has to work on, and I think this is a hard thing to work on, but he has to become craftier and a better finisher around the basket in traffic. And that's where, because I think he's so left-handed, I think teams, especially come playoffs, right? your weaknesses are exposed so much in the playoffs in basketball because you keep playing the same team and they get to know your tendencies even more because you're living it out in real life, not just on film. And so you start eliminating what a guy likes to do and can he make an adjustment to another move? And right now I think RJ Barrett, when he gets around the basket, you know, he has to get back to his left hand. And once he starts being able to, he has improved his shot tremendously. Once he can become a finisher with both hands and you're not, you know that he wants to go left, but when he goes right, or at least like Ginobili, who was left, he dominant, like no matter what Ginobili has another move for your move. Yeah. Like that's when he can become a really special player. And, and you, and you know, he's not comfortable with those counters yet because he's built like a brick shit house, and yet cannot draw fouls at a regular, or I shouldn't say cannot does not draw fouls at the rate. And that's aside from the finishing, which I completely agree. That's to me, the thing that he needs that's going to take him to the next level, because sometimes Nick fans will complain to me, Oh, RJ gets a terrible whistle. And I want like, no, you see guys in the NBA who get, they earn those like, I'm not talking about the Trey Young stuff. I'm talking about guys who like <laughs> they don't know. I'm just listen. Let's keep it 100. I'm talking about guys who like well Luca. I mean Luca, Jimmy Butler, um, even James Harden. Maybe not with some of the stuff on the perimeter, but when he drives, like the refs have to make they have to blow the whistle. RJ has that in him, but to your point, he needs to become more comfortable with the moves around the basket. He needs to hang out with whatever Oklahoma City started practicing in 2011. We are like Durant and Harden and Westbrook, I think, spent a whole offseason figuring out how to exaggerate foul calls or draw <laughs> fouls. Because aren't they three of the best in the NBA and they all were on they the are. same team in their early 20s? And you're like, I think they just practiced on how to draw fouls this whole offseason. Because like 2012 came along and they made it to the finals. And you're like, these MFers get to the line like 35 <laughs> times a game. And it's like, you're not really fouling them, but that's when Durant learned the, the yeah. right through, you know? And and then uh, Harden started throwing his head back as hard as he could. And then they would hook, you know, that, you know, Harden does that. He's getting ready to shoot. He doesn't even grab the ball with his right hand. He hooks your arm. Yeah. And then goes, oh, my God. And then puts his hand on the ball and shoots it up. And yeah. you're like, the dude didn't even do anything. He hooked them. But the rest, the rest, you know, I don't want to say they're stupid. They're great. They're the best at their job. It's just a tough job to do. Well, I'll be very curious to see with this news coming out the last few days that they're going to try to litigate, you know, some of this stuff out of the game. I mean, it's good luck. Um, I, I mean, look, I hope I hope they do, too. But uh, we'll see what happens. Um, our, I, God, I know we've gone way over. I can talk I, for hours. I was so. about to say, man, I, I, we got to really seriously. I, is there a radio station out there that caters to uh, Dallas and, and New York sports fans? I'll, they should hire us to do a, a two man show. Good at this. They pay me to talk. So <laughs> they, not enough. They should pay you more. <laughs> um, uh, OK, uh, before I let you go, can you just remind everybody where they could find you and all of your content? You can find me on 105.3 The Fan. Uh, so, obviously, if you are doing the, what is that, the Alexa and crap like that, you can just say, hey, Alexa, turn on 105.3 The Fan in Dallas. So turn on Mike Bassett. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. here in Central Time. That's uh, 11 to 3 uh, Eastern Time. Then I'm doing pre and post game uh, for the Rangers on Valley Sports Southwest, which – 
I got a lot. <laughs> I don't know how many people are tuning in to watch Rangers this year. So, um, and I'll then, be honest, I don't know their record. Are they, are they not doing that well? They have the third worst record in the Major League Baseball. So, yeah, it's it's a they're in the process. They've just started their rebuild, so it's okay. going to be three to five years before hopefully everything turns back around. Okay, and then I'm starting a YouTube page called the sports card breakdown, which I've done some episodes. This is sports. And then what the card market is doing based off of what guys are doing. I I have boxes upon boxes upon boxes of basketball cards in my attic, right above my head. I was for, from like, uh, not the Shaq draft from the Weber penny draft. That was my first year collecting. I don't know how many, I probably have a bunch of Penny Hardaway rookie cards up until maybe the Duncan draft. So for that like five year period, I have a bunch of Kobe and I was obsessed with collecting Jordan cards. I wanted all the Michael Jordan cards I could get for reasons. Well, if you have Kobe rookies, you need to get them out of that damn attic. (laughs) Are they, are they, I I guess they are probably doing pretty well. If you just have, let's just say now they've gone down a lot because the market has kind of gone down as COVID has like just everybody's out and about and taking summer vacation. So not as many people are on eBay and stuff like that. Uh But if you have like a Kobe card, like his, his tops rookie card, which they made a zillion of, you just have his tops rookie card ungraded, but it looks like it's in great condition. Corners look great. Centering looks great. That's $500. Are you shitting me? No. Oh, I'm speechless on my own. And it was, it was, higher it was about 800 at its peak about three months ago it's gone down if you were to get it graded i know i'm getting into card talk here I no but i love this if you know like psa or bgs those are the two major companies psa yeah. cards uh, hold more value if you had a psa 10 if it graded jim mint it's down when i say down to because it was at six thousand dollars, it's down to about twenty five hundred dollars. Maybe you get lucky and can get it at two grand. But the Lakers documentary is coming out this summer, I think. Or oh yeah, uh, yes, like That's that right. could drive his prices up again a little bit. But I mean, you're talking if you have if you have tops Chrome, that's even on a whole nother level. But like. It's if you have Kobe rookies, you need to to I, get them. Duncan rookies hold value. Steve Nash rookie cards hold good value. I, I have that class was I, not as many as I had for whatever reason. I went all in on 93, 94, which is not, has not aged that well. Um, but I got, I had so many J.R. Smith. Remember uh, J.R. J.R. Smith, J.R. Ryder um, yeah. or Isaiah Ryder, yeah. whichever your preference. Jamal yeah, the, first guy to, the first guy to do the dunk in between his legs. And the, exactly. And the, the dunk, dunk contest. dunk. Jamal, Jamal Mashburn was never with you guys. I don't think. Oh yeah. He was part of our three J's. Oh Jimmy yeah, that's Jackson. right. He was drafted by you. Oh my God, how could I forget? I Jimmy think Jackson, Jason Kidd, and Jamal Mashburn. We had a whole song. We got him. Dick Mata, we got him. And then two years later, we changed it to <laughs> "We Don't Want Him." So they all got in. <laughs> do you not? You need to look this up. They all got into a fight, kind of, over Tony Braxton. Tony Braxton broke up that team. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. Yeah. I think it was maybe I, I wasn't reading enough. Uh, where would I have read that? I was about to yeah. say blog. I mean, obviously, that's mid 90s. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, listen, what a great place to end this pod on Tony Braxton. I was a big fan of Tony Braxton. So there you go. Ruin the maps. Yeah. 